happened yesterday Holes for refuge, run away Keep your freedom, be not slaves We will lead them yesterday This most swamping yesterday House for refuge, run away Keep your freedom, be not slaves We will lead them yesterday This most swamping yesterday House for refuge, run away Keep your freedom, be not slaves We will lead them yesterday Wherever you go, I will go, I will climb We will not let one soul go behind There will be no treaty I will sign If it means we not free from their lies Wherever you go, I will go, I will climb We will not let one soul go behind There will be no treaty I will sign If it means we not free from their lies This month's swamping yesterday, hopes for refuge run away. Keep your freedom, be not slaves. We will lead them yesterday. This month's swamping yesterday, hopes for refuge run away. Keep your freedom, be not slaves. We will lead them yesterday. This most swamping yesterday. House for refuge, run away. Keep your freedom, be not slaves. We will lead them yesterday. This most swamping yesterday. House for refuge, run away. Keep your freedom, be not slaves. We will lead them yesterday. Wherever you go, I will go, I will climb We will not let one soul go behind There will be no treaty I will sign If it means we not free from their lies Wherever you go, I will go, I will climb We will not let one soul go behind There will be no treaty I will sign If it means we not free from their lies Good day, one and all. I am the co-host, Remedy, and I'm here with once again for our Sunday live stream. Uh, we are the Maroon Liberation School Book Club. Today, I have my lovely co-host, Carla, and our special guest, Spirit Child. Yes, so 
we're going to dive right into this. Um, you guys already have heard. If you haven't, check out our, pre our other videos if you want to learn more about us. Otherwise, come back and see me next week. But in the meantime, check out Carla. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, so this week, or weekend, Sunday, I guess, we're going to be um, reviewing the chapter, Stop Hating Women. All right, let's see, get the full title. Respect Our Mothers, Stop Hating Women, 2010, by our author, Russell Moon Schultz, who, as you know, hopefully by now that we've been reading his book for the past month and a half or so, um, and today we've invited Spear on to um, have a discussion with him about some tips for men specifically on praxis and how they can identify this internalized patriarchy that can really only be, um, you know, it's in, in the chapter, Russell talks about how this is a question that men need to be talking to each other about. Um, because if you have internalized patriarchy, it's there's still a, a layer there between you and really understanding like what another woman might be fully saying to you. And so um, we have invited Spirit to kind of um, give some guidance to men who might be struggling with those questions and trying to um, break down their own internalized patriarchy. So welcome, Spirit. Peace, 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 party people on a Sunday. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being consistent. Thank you for leading the way and the path for having um, something so significant, Maroon the Implacable. It's a book that I feel like many artists, authors, uh, revolutionaries, underground gem, you know, um, if you're just learning about it or if you're just reviewing it from 2013, it is something to pick up and read again. He was way ahead of his time then and he's writing new works now. Um, I do want to start off by saying that, you know, with respect to all the women, this is, you know, although we say every day is Women's Day and International Women's Day, um, I feel a little um, uh, inept to be speaking during this month. I was trying to silence myself during the month of March. Um, and we just did an amazing program with some beautiful queens, gods, and goddesses and had them speak on the platform. But since this is speaking to other men, I do feel comfortable and I think it's important to, um, to get into that. Um, and I do want to also say that um, our sensei, who is no longer here, Fred Ho, made Maroon the Implacable possible, along with Quincy Saul and the editing. Um, these are essays and compilations over a trajectory of years, right? So as I mentioned before, although he was ahead and still is ahead in his social theory, there are many other theorists who have been speaking on this um, term revolutionary matriarchy, which I think I would probably just say like that is where we need to be as men. We need to be revolutionary matriarchs. Um, Fred Ho is all over this book, but specifically in this chapter and the next one, um, there are some references directly to Fred Ho. And if you check within the fine lines, you can see the connection between the Maroon Party for Liberation, Scientific Soul Sessions, Maroon, Russell Maroon Schultz, the person, and Fred Ho. You can see all that. You'll make your own connections. We're all one big family tree. Um, and being a revolutionary matriarch and challenging internalized um, patriarchy uh, is, is, is not only critical for us today, it is something that we we must move forward in doing, right? Reevaluating our social structures, reevaluating our, our formational structures. Um, he speaks a lot in this chapter about even um, trying to combat patriarchy. Men, even himself, myself, Fred Ho, all of us have been victims of falling short and replicating these things that have been indoctrinated in us for centuries, right? We're talking about five, 6,000, 7,000 years of patriarchy and the rule over um, what we what we identify as, as as women. You know what I'm saying? Like it's one of the oldest existing forms of oppression to other beings per se, outside of animals and trees and mother nature, you know? Um, but when we think of us as human beings, it is one of the most existing oldest form of, um, of oppression. So any structure we believe in our formation 
that doesn't speak about this, that doesn't have not only social theories, but also practices and how to do that is falling short from the liberation of all human beings, right? It starts with that. If you can't get rid of that old patriarchy, then we can't move forward. Um, so one real, I know you mentioned a tip and I go off and off and off and I'm gonna stop at this point, but one real thing is me being a father that mothers, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of talk and conversation about uh, free goods and how women are being underneath this uh, uh, conversation that, well, you know, having a child is normal for you. So we're not going to see that as a labor. It's a labor of love. That's something that you've done. You'd be doing this. You just, you do that and we'll do this work and we'll count that as some other work, but we won't count your home work, your economics that, that comes within that, the fact that you're sacrificing, the fact that, you know, taking care of the house home, if you're in that traditional kind of realm, what we do is we flip it in our house, right? Like I actually take care of all of our little ones. Um, we have two of them. We've had home births. Um, I would say probably 300 days of the year straight, you know, um, minus some time when I go on tour, right? That's why I say three, six, 300, where I'm the primary caretaker and my partner is the one doing all the other work, right? That is valued in our society to maintain and sustain our, our ability to do revolutionary work. So I thank her for that. Right now, actually, she gave me a little break. So she's with um, our two cubs plus their cousin in the park. So we can have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right? I like to be in the sunshine too. Um, and, but that's, that's really important. That's the most practical thing that we can do right now is how to offset that imbalance of what we call women's work and how to make that all of our work. Absolutely. You know, I, I've been fortunate because I'm back in my traditional, we'll just say traditional days um, when I was, you know, in a hetero relationship and married. I, uh, my husband, and I, we, my late husband and I, we shared the same roles. We were both alpha. Okay, we were both, we both bred, breadwinners. We were both like stay at home domestics, you know, part of the time. And it was awesome to be able to do that. You know, there was like no difference between us, you know, but if you think about it, like, thank goodness I had that experience because, you know, what, what'd you say? Six, 7,000 years of male dominance or, you know, patriarch, whatever, this bull that we've been dealing with. And look what it got us, folks. So, any word, any thought on that, Carla? Or should we talk about the author first? I don't know. Before we get, you already know I'm finding my quotes so that the people can be looped in. So I'm with this five, six thousand years ago. I want people to have some context. Find your okay. quotes. I'm yes. going to talk a little bit about our author. Oh wait, oh, sorry. I, I got the quote. I'm ready to go. Okay, go for oh. it. Okay, page 195. So, uh, patriarchy and the roots of women's oppression. Patriarchy is a system of male dominance over women emerged some five, six thousand years ago among certain tribes living in Central Asia, Asian steeps north of the Black Sea. The Kurgan people were able to make war face and conquest of other tribes and their territory the main source of their wealth. Um, and so this means the reason that there was this kind of inversion was uh, no longer uh, a care for or uh, the need for the support and idea of sustainability within a community it was now a switch to like the power in the hands of being able to take over other uh, tribes or violence became the main economy uh, rather than sustainability yeah but there's some context <laughs> absolutely thank you you know and it just goes to show you that like there's ebb and flows to everything you know but like women have not had the opportunity to step up and to lead the way so, and when, but our time is here and it is coming. <laughs> Get ready, boys and girls. It's happening. It's happening. But what it does, we have to be ready as well to ebb and flow with it because we need that strength, you know, uh, just as much as they need our strength and our presence to basically dominate them. <laughs> I, I will say that I think um, it, it, for sure, um, women have been and continue, even though we're talking on the mainstream, right? We're talking about patriarchy, capitalism being like this dominance. However, there have been societies and it still continues to be societies and even formations. When we think of the Black Panther Party, 
Um, even though you see a lot of the testosterone, right, in the images of the guns and the leather jackets and all that stuff, it was the women who were actually the backbone and the saviors of that party, right? Like, and they were the ones that held everything together. You know, um, they just never throughout our history. And he, I like a quote also, and um, I love that you got the numbers um, and, and, and uh, Maroon the Implacable, where he's speaking in this same chapter, he's talking about, we all know Dr. Martin Luther King and how we replicate, we don't really know the works of Ella Baker, right? We're not really talking about um, the people who have been fighting side by side, um, the Iroquois, um, the first uh, confederations, the indigenous peoples, Lenape, um, we're talking about like a lot of African tribes, Yoruba, Akan, uh, Candoble out in Brazil, many formations outside of white supremacy. And you know this, if you black and brown indigenous and you out there, even you white too, you out there watching this, look at your family structure. <laughs> the women are the ones that hold it down. I'm talking about like, not only from the household, but even so much to the point of finances, right? Like making the right choices on what to invest in or consume for the family. Um, this is something that women have always been uh in that position of power, it just doesn't translate outside. You know, like on the outside, all we see is men. All we see is the faces of the men um, speaking, talking heads, but the women are the ones that the men ask for counsel. And actually what it needs to happen is the men need to just step aside because the woman's time has always been, you're always leading. We just need to hear from you directly and not indirectly with the male patriarchal edits when it's convenient for the men to lead countries, nations, communities, formations, organizations, and all that stuff. Because women have always been and they continue to be. I just wanted to make that point because the time has been now. It is now. It's happening. This formation, the Maroon Party for Liberation, is predominantly um, identify women. You know, um, the ones that are leading the formation within our spheres, as you can see, we have Carla and Remedy, are women. You know, um, women are the ones that bring the aesthetic, they bring the vibe, they bring the flavor, they bring the nurturing. Um, they bring all things constructive, creative, and productive for societies. And patriarchy, when you're, when we're talking, I'm going back to that first question, when we challenge ourselves, we have to say, what is the dominating factor? Why do we have to have war or violence as something that we see as credible? Why do we have to conquer another nation to feel like we're leading or doing something in our world? Why do we have to conquer Mother Earth to feel like we're in control. And that's that's not coming from women. When we look at the Iroquois, Lenape, as I mentioned, all these indigenous cultures, there's less carbon footprint, respect for mother nature, respect for each other. There's restorative justice, transformative justice in the communities. That's natural, right? There's not a punitive measure that continues to pervade. And I mentioned earlier that Maroon, also, he got put on to revolutionary matriarchy by Fred Ho, right? So we learned directly from Fred Ho. And the stuff that we have been learning, all these references and resources that he's, you know, um, uh, Queen Shiva, who's on there, um, Maria Miles, and all the other people that have been referenced in that book, those are documents that we actually read when we talk about revolutionary matriarchy assess, process, and dive into. And, and these are archeological facts and that's science to, to balance out the fact that we feel we know it's right, women should be leading. I would like to say that one of the reasons why I am so like right or die with this is because of how comfortable I feel in my shoes, how comfortable I feel in this position right here. It's, and it's because uh, as I get deeper into the, the literature and, you know, the truth, I, you, I can see firsthand both in, in what I've learned about Fred Ho. We got to have this moment. Thank you. Ashe. That's for Fred Ho, but we got to have take those moments, those spiritual moments, um, but not to lose sight of what I was saying. Oh, it, it, from what I read about um, from of Fred Ho and both Russell Maroon, Schultz, the author, he, uh, you can see, well, I've seen like their own personal 
growth and development and their own transformation in their writings. And it's kind of beautiful how they just put their heart out there, their soul out there, their humanness out there. And uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, let's see. Moving on. Carla, I know that you have some input. Yes, I do. Um, so for spirit, we obviously, based on everything that you've said so far, we can see you've done a lot of work to break down those walls of patriarchy and like really get real with yourself. And um, it's no longer, I mean, I, I don't know what, what your process was. And so I guess I'm asking what steps like backtrack and when you were at kind of the beginning of this process of learning and unlearning, where did you begin? And what are the steps that you have taken? And what, after that, what advice can you offer other men who are trying to begin this journey? Nice questions. Okay, okay, I see what's going on here. <laughs> I like it, nice, real good. Um, so um, for me personally, I was raised by my mother, right? Um, and I was also parented by a village of cousins, our primas, tias. So my aunts, my cousins, all predominantly women who took care of me. Um, they would look after me. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, um, I'm Puerto Rican and Jamaican, right? With also roots in the South um, as well with my father. And there's a that's a very hyper machismo masculine culture, just to be real. Um, the way I was raised, it was like, if I needed something, my mother would say, get one of your cousins to do it. And my cousins would have to take care of me. Although I was younger than them and capable of doing it, it'd be like, why are you cooking your own food? You know, um, why are you washing your own clothes, et cetera, et cetera. However, when I was my mother um, alone, because she raised me alone, when it was just me and her, she would teach me, you know, how to listen, how to fold, how to cook, um, how to how to clean the home. So everything I learned in this particular theoretical way, I actually had some pretty good um, knowledge from my moms, right? Politically, when I got involved, and I've always been kind of a little quiet, um, when I got involved politically and organizing, I'd say more in high school after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, which put me on, um, all of my leaders or the people that I was consuming for knowledge were pretty patriarchal, right? On the outside, externally, politically, a lot of the information was war, combating war, how to counter war, um, how to resist against a genocide. A lot of the, the that information was very male dominated. Um, male patriarchal dominated, because again, you can be a male and be a revolutionary matriarch, just to be clear. Um, it wasn't until uh, I, well, I went to college and then I started studying um, the psychology of women and and I wanted to get into the field of psychology and I had a, uh, a, a desire to learn more about um, what what's, what's, why is there such social construct differences between men and women and what does that really mean? So I actually got it more on an academic, um, less than a political side. And then I started realizing that as I was, as I learned politically through my surroundings in high school and learning a bit more with Malcolm X and the theories and all that, I started realizing that this science is connected to the politic, right? So there's something there. Um, our formations, and I've always had this, I think it's more my family structure that allowed me to be on the side, like allow women step aside. If they have something to say, try to listen more and speak less. Now it was also difficult because I'm not perfect at all, right? Um, my patriarchal tendencies get challenged all the time, even until like just last month, you know, where um, there's certain aggressions that I have um, when I debate, when I get fiery, and I tend to have this um, masculine or machismo come out where my voice is louder and I'm just more aggressive and I'm more like, well, we're boxing. And I'm thinking that that's okay, right? 
and that's not okay. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how to balance being so adamant politically and where I feel things need to be, but also being more nurturing and understanding where everybody else is and how to be patient with that and grow the differences. That's a hard thing, right? Um, so I've had a lot of falling out. I still have falling out with people. Some people attribute it to me being just a passionate, fiery person. And some people use it politically to say, yo, you're patriarchal, that's whack. You need to work on that. And actually it's even double whack because your formation says that you're a revolutionary matriarch and that's what you're working on and you fall in mad short. Um, so thank goodness and goddess that I have a lot of women in our circle that check me. And I'll also say spiritually, right? Because um, I'm a Yoruba priest and within Yoruba or Santeria is also predominantly women, right? As in, as in um, Afro-Cuban, or um, indigenous African uh, spirituality or spiritual practice. And in our household, when we pray, when we do our ceremony, it's all women that lead it. So I think for me, at least, I probably would be more hyper-masculine than I already am. However, the um, the seeing and working in, 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 in community and ceremony with people has allowed me to reflect on that. Right, like I learned from my mother. I learned from uh, the women that she's around. I learned from the the other women that are around our circle, even if they're younger. And when they're younger, I learn from them and I listen as much as possible. So for me, it takes a lot of listening. And I even tell you this much: even till this day, um, I'm, I've undergone a somatica, which is a combination of erotica as well as the somatic. Uh, psychological transformations that we need to have for some kind of healing or or, or listening in, in that particular uh, approach and becoming uh, a sex and relationship coach in that, right? Like internalize and trying to dissect myself even further, which I've been privileged to do. And even there, I'm like, wow, I still got way more work. So politically wasn't enough. Academically, it wasn't enough. Um, even spiritually, it wasn't enough. Um, I have to also think about sexually what that means for me and how I relate and relationally, right, to other people. So these are personal things that I'm diving into a praxis of how to dismantle that. Now, not everybody can have the privilege to do all these different holistic ways of trying to heal and, and recover from the conditions of patriarchy. I will say, when in doubt, shut your mouth and just listen to women and hear what, and not be so defensive, right? Because I'm a very defensive person. Um, and to try to listen to the critiques that's happening and not say, oh, like, I'm not a patriarch. You know what's a patriarch? Number 45 is a patriarch. You know, Biden's a patriarch. Like, you know, I'm like not comparing and trying to be like, well, I'm the lesser of those evils, even though I'm permeating some of these things. Um, so you asked the question, I was loaded. It's a process and I'm still undergoing that process. Um, I'm still learning from people in that process and I'm learning more how to breathe through listening, you know, or listen through breathing and, and, and try to go through these cycles of like, what am I supposed to be hearing right now? You know, and I'm hearing a lot uh, of nurturing, a lot of, of, of power that comes from, there's an urgent militancy However, there's a patience and compassion with the people that we're working with, and we need to have that as humans. If we're gonna transform humanity in any aspect, I don't care what it is, we need to learn how to listen to each other, even those that we argue with. You know, I have people, I'm like, I thought I was on your side. They start throwing daggers at me, and I'm like, ha, throwing them back. And then I'm like, wait, do I need to throw it back right now, or do I need to just listen? Maybe that person's coming from a hurtful space, how do I um, listen to that unconditionally, compassionately, and not take it personal? And that's why I feel like the somatica is coming in because political theory just makes you want to fight. <laughs> you know, you, just, you know, like you, you are, they're like, I got my books, what you want? You know, but it's not about that. At, the, at those moments, somebody is seeking some kind of attention or help or questioning even, right? And how do we find the questions in those attacks and figure out how to better our, our overall society. You know, if that answers any, any of the questions. <laughs>
That, that answers a lot of my question. <laughs> I think some things that you highlighted that are really important stand out to me, obviously listening, um, because how are we gonna understand each other if our ears aren't open as well? Um, also, and not being defensive, because I've often experienced with men that when I have something to say to counter an argument or to point out some uh, something that's like patriarchal or then you know just sexist, whatever, there is always uh, an excuse for why they said that. Um, it's always no, that's not what I was saying. This is what I was saying. Let me tell you, woman, what I'm thinking because you're clearly not getting it. And that's that's the response most of the time. Even with men that think that they're like one with all women, all people, it's still comes out. And I really appreciate your honesty and humility uh, spirit because, you know, it's not something we get to see from a lot of men. <laughs> um, or, or, Remy, do you have anything you want to add there? I do. You know, honesty is such, it puts you in such, it takes so much courage to be honest. And it, it really also puts you in a very vulnerable position as well. But there's strength in that. You know, and there's power that come that's that that's in that, and that's because it's the truth. And there's nothing better than what rings true to you. You know, it resonates at a frequency that you cannot doubt that you know is truth. And so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And when it comes to this whole um, like sexual liberation, okay, um, and intimacy, a lot of men are afraid to get out of missionary. You know, are they? <laughs> or else they want to go straight to a home run. And I'm like, wait a minute, let's go check out the stands and get some peanuts over here. And like there's dugouts and all kinds of stuff, visiting teams, away teams. I mean, it's all there. So there's so much more to the playing field than just, you know, come here, lay down, take it. Like, like what? Like traditional style uh, intimacy? Um, that is so like 80s, 90s, I don't know. And then some. That's so 6,000 years ago. <laughs> They've been doing it the same forever, you know? And um, I, me, I mean, I've been practicing non traditional sexual behavior for ever since I got widowed. You know, I did two years of celibacy and then straight into a, you know, same sex relationship with a dominant woman. She was never my dominant, but she was my very angry girlfriend because I was just new to it. And um, we we would share intimacy with each other, but we would also share it with our other partner, sometimes plural. Um, but again, non-traditional. It's not like we were just, you know, doing it, the act. We were doing, there was just so much more intimacy and um, vulnerability. And it's still very, you know, I mean, it's still, sexual, it's just non-traditional. And f when people are willing to step outside of their comfort zone, the norm, the box, that's, that's where you get to explore and grow. That's where you get to learn and, you know, experience things that are, that, that you have never even thought of, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's when you fall down in outside of the, outside of that box, that you really get to grow. So the battles and and the resistance or the fears that we all struggle in, we all struggle in it just like we all fuck. Same thing, you know? I mean, but do you grow from it? Spirit child, it sounds like you definitely have been growing from it. I'm trying. I, I want I want to figure out how to like I, I want to go back to what Carla just said. I think I think we're on to something. I think um uh, uh, as a double entendre, but but something that can lead or lend to to what we need to do, right? Like when we talk about making the revolution sexy and like how to entice more people, I think I love that as like a t-shirt, like stop the missionary position that's so 6,000 years ago. You know? And then like, what does that do to somebody when they're thinking about that, right? Like no offense to people who who, who love missionary and want to do I that. Love missionary. I mean, I don't hate it. And there are so many other ways to love and to climax and to to achieve whatever liberation, whatever goal you want. And and I think it's really important to to talk about 
our sexuality or relationships, which we don't talk about a lot, right? And this is when we talked, you asked earlier about working with, um, or how do I work? And then also maybe working with other people. When we're at Rikers, right? When we're working with young men who, that is nothing but, it breeds patriarchy. I mean, it just breeds toxicity and everything else that comes with it. So you you can't go up in there and tell a young man, yo, you need to respect women. Like, it's not going to work. You know, like, I mean, even Maroon talks about, like, you can't replace um, patriarchal capitalism with patriarchal socialism, right? And one of the things that Marx and all these isms, they fall short, is reimagining or thinking maybe they never had it right. Maybe the formulas and the way that these men have been thinking of how to analyze and scientifically deconstruct, maybe they're reconstructing or, or, or building off of the foundation of toxicity already. Yeah. Like that equation is whack. So maybe yeah. that's not something we need to even be talking about. I mean, it's good to learn. We should all learn that and then move from that, right? So when, we, when we're when we with our young men and women, especially men out in Rikers or in prison or, or in Belgium, wherever we are, the men are always just, it's natural. It's just aggressive. And they're just like, F this, be that, F this, F, you know, and everything. And then we've got, all right, cool. Like, let it out. Let it out. Because that's therapeutic. Let it out. And then let's talk about that. Why do you feel you need to talk about that? Like when Maroon's talking about this conversation, like, what do you mean? Like, I love women. I respect my woman. But what about all the other women? Maybe they're the B-I-T-C-H's. And you're like, wait, that's not really, okay, you just completely missed it. Now, if you respect and honor your mother, if you truly do, you would also respect and honor Mother Earth, vice versa. You would also respect and honor any woman that comes to your path. You don't differentiate. And if you do, that means there's a part of your mother that you're disrespecting. So let's have that conversation. How do you feel that your mother hurt you? What what do you feel do you need? What do you need to tell your mother right now that you didn't get to say in a, in a more constructive way, right? Like what are you looking for to get out of this conversation of of, of dominance or um, or degradation, you know, like what is it that you gain from oppressing your fellow sister? Why do you do that? And then analyze that. And and speaking of when you talk about the the sexual liberation, this is what I'm learning in other spaces, you know, in in somatic and going through this process is like you can play out. Whatever you want to play out, as long as you're safe and healthy and you're not harming people, but you should play that. You should figure out how to train yourself or be with other people to, to, to play that out. Because there's a lot of people that are not trying to play that game with you. And they don't know that you're playing, right? And people, it's a, it's a life and death situation. You can't promote that aggression and say that this is okay. Because then people start thinking rape is okay. They start thinking um, not only silencing women is okay, but everything else that comes with that is okay. And we need to speak about that because not only is that counter-revolutionary and counterproductive, um, it is not liberating our humanity and it's not liberating the individual who's caught and trapped in that toxicity. You gotta get out that bubble. Um, and we're all working it out, but we need to find these spaces, right? Like when you work with somebody and say, if you feel like you need to dominate someone, if that's what's in you, there's a space for that, as long as there's consent in that particular thing. And I think a lot of presidents and people in power need to learn. You can ask women. <laughs> Responsibly. <laughs> I think of, uh, absolutely. Uh, there is a safe way of doing it. You know, and we're not going to get too far into that right now. But, uh, but for myself, personally, I know that. I went through a transformation because um, I was on a road to really becoming a man hater when I was 15, 16 years old. Thank you, daddy. Yeah, really. But I met a beautiful man, you know, that showed me that not all men are going to hurt me or, or, you know, whatever. Thanks, dad. Um, so shout out to him. That's all right. But I worked through it, you know, because it was either going to block me from this beautiful lifetime of love and three beautiful children. And like, I will, even though he's no longer with me, I will always have that love because my dad didn't get to block me or, or trauma didn't get to block it, you know, but 
It almost did, but I, I, you know, it almost did. It almost did. And I remember it like it's yesterday. It was God talking to me clear as day and asked me now that, okay, are you going to let your father ruin forever? Are you going to let him keep this from you? And in an instant, I didn't even have to think about the answer. I, I was over it. Like, you know, I was over it. And so there are these like, and same thing when we were going talking about, um, you know, the whole patriarchy, the, the, the way things have been led by this male dominance. I look at my role in how I have helped and how can I now transform it from me being an enabler and accepting and allowing that way, that rule to continue to govern us into how am I going to just disappear it? <laughs> how am I going to disappear it? The same way, you know, they disappeared our heritage and our culture and our roots and our spirituality and our, our land and everything else, you know, like not the same way, but we're not going to rewrite history books. We're going to spread the truth. We're going to talk about knowledge and facts. So speaking of knowledge and facts, I don't want to forget to talk about the author of this book and the sorts of inspiration for this book club. Thank you, Russell Maroon Schultz. So um, we are, he is uh, dying in prison, in a cell. And every day I make sure to put in a lot of energy, positive thought, and then follow it, all, follow it along with action. What can I do? What can I do? So I'm here doing my best. And I think I'm doing a pretty good job. Look at this. You guys are beautiful. Um, what are we, what, what, what's up with Maroon? What's up with Russell Maroon? Hmm, hmm. Spirit child, I think you probably have the most knowledge. Well, um, I, I, could, I, could, I could say a few things about Maroon. Um, first, mm -hmm. thank you for everything that you have said and everything that you both bring. Um, and remembering to also take time and space. You know, I've seen you do it a few times here. Um, pardon everybody who's out there. We do a lot of assessments internally, so we're just kind of doing a little bit of assessments real quick. But, um, you know, acknowledging Fred Ho, you know, um, Ibaye Ashe, who's no longer here, right? Instead of just trucking through and talking about who he was and just calling his name out, but letting people know and feel what he's also meant to us, even if you haven't met him personally, you can see what is happening as a result of that. You can feel that there are people outside who are here just got a chance to look at some of the people that are chiming in who are like directly connected in the way of our formation, but the readings and teachings and then acknowledging, you know, that Russell Maroon Schultz, you know, yeah, he's dying. You know, a lot of our elders are dying behind prison. Um, and if we're talking about respecting our mothers, I mean, we have to figure out how to abolish this toxic ecosystem of oppression. Um, the prison industrial complex breeds toxicity. It is not healing. It is not therapeutic. It is not um, anything that gives any incentive or lending towards the rehabilitation that they claim to promote um, for anyone, um, especially our elders. So we have a call to not only free them all, but in the immediate right now, any elder over the age of 50 years old should not be in prison. Um, so people like release aging, uh, people from prison, rap, uh, Laura Whitehorn working hard on that particular angle. Um, also, they just did an amazing program speaking and honoring and saying, not only should we do that for our elders 50 plus, but like women shouldn't be in prison, right? Like shouldn't be in prison. Um, period. When you think of Asada Shakur being shackled um, and, and giving birth, when you think of like the other women that are going through this, this process of not only um, humiliation, but genocide, right? Um, holistic genocide. We're talking about spirituality, what it does to you, your spirit, what it does to your mind, body, and soul. Anybody who's been on the inside has come out, whether you visited or not, you can see 
the walls, the structures, the smell, everything is nothing but patriarchal toxicity. That being said, um, Russell Maroon Schultz was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, part of that toxicity that it breeds, um, a lot of these prisons are constructed in dump sites. We think of Rikers Island, that was a garbage dump. You put a garbage dump and you try to build something to claim to rehabilitate, you're just basically building up cages so that people can die in a place where well, our brother Kempis has said um, uh, a warehouse, right? They call them warehouses uh, of oppression, you know, per se, you know, um, and people are just being bred this. Um, we're not going to even, because I know people who are watching this who are, they already know what the prison industrial complex does, but, you know, the connection between that and cancer is real. The connection between the other pandemic that we have, um, which is COVID, is real, right? He was diagnosed with COVID. Thank God is he survived that. But who's to say he won't get it again, right? And this is a problem with all of our prisoners who are uh, political prisoners who are held behind bars and just our people, our people who are held behind um, the exposure to, to annihilation is just very real. And for Mumia Abu-Jamal, you can see that they're trying to kill him behind bars, right? Um, not only having uh, heart failure and hepatitis, uh, now COVID, right? And it's an emergency call to free him because as, as, as one uh, Dr. Alvarez has been stating, which is amazing and brilliant, this should be for all of our people across the board, but the, um, the only treatment is freedom. You can't treat somebody in prison for COVID or, or cancer and think they're gonna recover from that. They shouldn't be in those cells. Um, uh, so uh, his spirits have been up and down. You know, we have a meeting, those who are interested, every Thursday at 8 p.m. We meet, we don't just speak and read about um, our comrades and the political social theories, but we actually utilize that to organize, strategize for the liberation of all political prisoners. And it's been really effective, if that very minimum effective in bringing up all of our people together. Um, I see San, uh, Sandy, Sandy on here um, out in um, Philly. We're organizing in different places and going back and forth with the Mumia camp, as well as the, um, the Maroon camp. Um, I saw Beth Bliss contributing her music to that. Um, as well as Brad as well, um, Rose is on here. You know, we have a bunch of people and people who are not in this particular space who have been um, effective in nurturing not only the ideology, but the, the ontological um, necessity that we need to move our movement forward. Um, so April 24th and 25th, we're going out to Philadelphia for Russell Maroon Schultz and Mumia Abu-Jamal. Mumia Abu-Jamal's birthday is April 24th. So we're going to go out there and share our solidarity and support. And on the 25th, we're going to be working in Russell Maroon Schultz's um, mother's garden. So we're going to be doing a lot of gardening and helping in that. And actually, um, Maroon talks about this a lot as far as gardens. There's another garden project that we're doing here for Eric Gardner who was a horticulturalist. Um, people may remember him as being one of the first people, I can't breathe, um, assassinated, modern day lynched here on Staten Island, right down the block from us. So there's a park that we're working to campaign and transform that park to Eric's legacy garden. His daughter has been really um, vocal. She's six years old. She's been at our events. Um, she's amazing. She's brilliant. And this is the life and the nurturing and the, and the matriarchy and the revolutionary matriarchy that we're trying to foster or where we are fostering. Um, so that park is in honor of his daughter's name, but also in honor of the fact that he worked as in the park department and he was a horticulturalist and he was a father and he was a, a lover in the community. He was loved by the community, not that he was whatever they claimed he was and the only picture that they have, which is that um, whack ass picture that they always put in the media. Um, so, um, however, I say that, and I also say with Maroon that our political prisoners, it has been said many, many times over and over again, they have fought and they would do it again, right? We fight and we do it again. Um, they are not sorry for being political prisoners. So don't feel or be sorry for them. Just organize, right? If you wanna remember and honor any of our comrades who had died behind the walls, find an organization and get your ass to work. 
Don't allow their freedom to be in vain. Do something with it. You know, if you reading something, if you hearing this, if you seeing this or whatever, like don't just look at it as a program. Ask yourself, what the hell are you doing today for the liberation of humanity? What are you doing for the liberation of your people? What are you doing for anyone, your children, other than, you know, just going day by day by day? We all have day by day by day struggles. And then we have other things that we have to do, unfortunately, and we need everyone's support. So organize with us. Um, information will be given. You see this channel, um, you know, lock in, log on, get down with it. Um, and I also say that to say that there are moments when Russell Maroon show sounds really good, right? Um, inspirational and the liberation that's here. A lot of our political prisoners, if not all of them, are freer than the majority of the population on the outside. So definitely don't feel sorry for them in that fact. Catch up. You know, start reading, start getting liberated, because if you think you're free, that's because you're not in that toxic environment. Remember, you are living within a patriarchal society for over 6,000 years. There can't be more oppression than that. So look around you and find an oppression and do something about it. And that's wow. what we're going to do. That was amazing. If you think you're free, guess again. You're uh, Wait, guess again. Because you've been living in a patriarchal society for over six, well, how many years? Too many. We say they 6, say five to six thousand, and even um, Abdullah Oshala, who's who's another political prisoner, Kurdish political prisoner um, from Turkey, out there in, the, in that region. We organize with a lot of people um, in the Rojava uh, camps out, you know, throughout the world. So it's international. He is to us like a Russell Maroon Schultz also writes a lot about revolutionary matriarchy. And according to him, he says um, anywhere between five to 7,000 years, Russell Maroon Schultz puts five to 6,000 years. Either way, you know it's too damn long. The last five minutes is too damn long of their rule. <laughs> yes, indeed. Brilliant. I mean, so insightful. Thank you so much for sharing with us this knowledge, this game. This is like, Beautiful. And again, inspired by Russell Maroon Schultz. You know, and, and you're right, Spirit. You got to do something. I, I mean, I'll be glad come, come the end of my time and I get to transcend into the next flower or whatever it will be. It will be um, knowing that I did something. I did something, you know. God. The struggle is real. Anyways. Let's see. Carla. Doing it, and I thank you for doing it. I thank you, Carla, for doing it. Um, I thank you for being involved and jumping in um, and also just taking the ranks, right? Like feeling it in your heart and then figuring out, okay, I'm going to learn these things gradually, but I know there's something inherently wrong here and I'm going to do something right now. I'm not going to wait until it clicks up here before I actually move. So I really appreciate you as being examples of what revolutionary looks like and being those seeds and flowers and having all the other people buzz be around you um, and, and continue to organize with us in any category that they can. So it's really, it's really infectious. So thank you so much. I love when I get pollinated. Yes, pollinate my flowers. Like I'm not in the eyes, all the allergies are happening now. Worth it. Bring it, keeping it real. <laughs> All I was going to say is thank you, Spirit, once again for coming and, and yeah, staying true and yeah, keeping real always and giving strong advice to any men out there that are watching this because it's something that it's not just something that can passively happen. It's it's like action that needs to be taken now, identifying this within yourself, because before, if you haven't worked in here first how are we going to work outside and help other people if you think you can jump onto this and be helping other people and be fully there without doing any work here thinking about why you might be perpetuating these ideas or why you get defensive when people ask you certain questions you're not going to be an effective leader or a participant in this movement so check yourself first and then we'll all be able to work together so and men like spirit men like chill like men like you make great leaders because real men recognize that you 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 operate from a, from a, a 
a place that is not of the ego. It's not of the penis. It's it's a place that's that has a lot of humility, you know, and it's it's beautiful. Real men recognize that and will flock to you. They will you will lead many real men and and empower them to step up and to rise up. I know I saw my husband doing it. I'm just saying, and he was very strong, very, very gentle, very compassionate, you know, and not like anyone else I've ever met in my life. Um, From I'm, one love to goddesses ears. Um, I try every day and I fail a lot of times, but at least I'm trying. I think that's, that's my motto. My motto is I'm going to fail many times, but I'm going to try as much as possible. I've definitely hurt a lot of people along the way, um, especially women. And um, I, I, I try to be as, um, rectifying as possible in my process and and try to be one with that and not allow that to deter me from not trying again you know um in, in other forms and fashion so um yeah we all trying see and as long as we're learning along the way you know don't be that fool that keeps making the same mistake over and over it's not you know i mean it's what you do after you fuck up right <laughs> it's what you do immediately after Mm -hmm. Or as my little wife always said, don't apologize, just correct the behavior. Well, and we're kind of wrapping things up now, but before we finish, I want to plug um, our March 20th event with the North Sphere. Thank it's you. Event honoring Dr. Matula Shakur, another political prisoner. Mm -hmm. um, he was an acupuncturist in New York working to uh, combat the opioid crisis, and now he is in prison, but we are or I, I'm not personally, but supporting the North Sphere in this event. So if you can come March 20th, there's a Facebook event Party for Liberation page um, with the Zoom link included. And if you liked this, come back for more yeah. the Maroon Party Liberation School on April 12th. We're starting back up with season three. Season three? Yeah. So three. Meet us there, and we'll be here next weekend. So magic number. <laughs> Yes. And what else? I know there's something else I'm forgetting. Let's see. We have the 20th. We have the 20th. Uh, again, the Mumia and um, Russell Maroon shows back to back is March 24th and 25th. April. April, April. 20th and 23rd. Yeah, I was yeah, just April terrifying 23rd. because oh, Carl yeah, yeah. and I were wondering. So I was oh. like, okay, excellent. I'm glad I have time to plan. And all of our international people, um, we will be out there. I'll be out there. Um, hopefully, I think everything is solidified, but I'll be back in Belgium and doing a little mini tour going back because some of the prisons have opened up for us to do stuff on the outside. So we're happy to do that work again. We do that at least twice a year. Um, so I'll be out there again this weekend for three weeks. So I'll be Zooming in from y'all. Y'all probably won't miss it because we always zoom in each other, but I'll be zooming in from across the waters um, and 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 giving some love and energy from there. We are Zoom mates, you know. <laughs> right Carla, thank you again for helping pull off such a lovely, lovely book club. What? Thank you to all of our viewers who joined us today. We invite you back next week. And if not, who cares? Pick up a book and read it. Read a, read a book that's, uh, that tells the truth, though. And um, how about a, uh, you know, let's see, what are we going to do? I know, Free Maroon. Who? Free Maroon. Yeah. Who? Free Maroon. Free Maroon. Free who? Free, free Maroon. Maroon. And free them all. Free them free all. Them. Yes. We have lots of work to do. Peace. Peace, Peace. everybody. Thank you. Oh, wait, let's see if there's any questions from the, wait, don't go, don't go. Okay. Are there any questions from our, our, our chat? Let's see, the energy and the love. We got a lot of nice comments. Hold on. We got a lot of nice comments here. Oh, my goodness. I'm never going to close this page now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I've got to go to work. Okay, fine, Carlo. Did you, have you been able to read the chats? We got like uh, your love and energy uh, for the people. Keep me going. Thank all three of you today so much with love. Yes, that's right. Serving the people, right? Hmm. Hmm. We got to be careful. No, we got to be carefree. Fuck that. Thank you all. I mean, forget that. Potty mouth. It's all good. It's all good. We got this. I just swear jar so I can scream in it. <laughs> See you guys. Peace. 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 Lots of it.